Okay, so Sully's on the couch and he's ready and you're here and you're ready and I guess I'm ready, so here we go. I want to talk to you today about the Articles of Confederation and then Shays' Rebellion and how that kind of ties together and brings us into a new constitution. The cats are having a discussion. Please ignore them. They're very rude. Okay, so let me share my screen here with my mad technical skills. Okay. And there. Now, the Articles of Confederation and Perpetual Union is the actual name of the document. So you can see why we just call it Articles of Confederation or just the Articles, because that's way too long. Uh, it was the first written constitution of the United States. It was the first time they used the name United States of America and wrote that down and said, that's what this is going to be called. The convention to write this began or was convened on June 11th of 1777. The first draft of the articles was written by Benjamin Franklin, but apparently it was pretty far out and they didn't really just kind of looked at it and went, yeah, no. And so then the second and third drafts were written by a man named Silas Dean from Connecticut. They took some what they liked of that, said what they didn't like. And a fourth draft was written by a man named John Dickinson from Pennsylvania. And that's the one that was taken and finally twisted and became the Articles of Confederation. The document was submitted to all of the states in November of 1777. All of the states except for Maryland had approved it by 1779. Maryland was holding out and refusing because all of the, a lot of the other states were claiming all of the land to the west of where they actually were, their original charter was, and saying, you know, everything else that's out there is ours. And Maryland was like, yeah, no, that's not going to work. And so um, Thomas Jefferson kind of went to Virginia, which was one of the large states at that time. And I'm sorry, I'm in Texas and that makes me giggle a little when I think that Virginia is a large state, but back then it was, you know? And so um, he convinced Virginia to let their claim go. And then they could convince the other states that, you know, let that claim go. And Maryland finally agreed to approve the Articles of Confederation all of that land that was out there to the west of the original 13 colonies, which became the 13 states, was changed into territories, which were eventually made into states and admitted into the Union. <coughs> so the powers that were granted to the federal government in the Articles of Confederation were that it could maintain armed forces, it could make alliances and treaties with other countries. It could coin or create money. Uh, it managed the Indian affairs. It served as the final authority in disputes between the states. The states were to extend full faith and credit to each other. And there were supposed to be no restrictions between movements or travel between the states. The weaknesses were that there was no power to impose taxes or raise money. Now, even today, we think of the government as having all this money, but they don't have any money that they don't take from us in taxes. You know, the government's not out there doing an Uber driving and delivering pizzas on the side as a side hustle to raise money. If they don't get it in taxes, pardon me, they don't have any money. They had no power to regulate commerce between the states they had no real authority to back up any of their decisions. At this point, there was only one house in Congress. There wasn't the three branches that we know of in the Constitution that we have now. There was just one house of Congress. Each state got one representative that they sent, and all of the states had to agree in order to amend or change this document. That's 13 people. You're never going to get 13 people to agree on anything at all, hardly ever. So this was a very difficult situation. Now, <clears throat> let's talk for a minute about Shays' Rebellion. Now, don't make the mistake that I always made. Apparently, I didn't pay attention and didn't read the, the assignments when I was in school. 
that it's his last name is Shays, S H A Y S, not Shay. So the, that is spelled correctly with the apostrophe. I didn't just put the apostrophe in the wrong place because his last name was Shays. I always thought his name was Shay and it was his rebellion. So it was an apostrophe, yes, but it's not. Sorry about that little side trip. Daniel Shays was born in Massachusetts in 1747. He was a farm laborer. He was a guy that worked on a farm. He didn't own any land of his own. He joined the Continental Army and fought in many battles and was wounded and apparently served, you know, as a good soldier and did a good job. He returned home in 1780 and he didn't get any pay for his military service, which is going to become a problem. So he was sued for debts that had built up while he was off in the army fighting and not getting paid anything. And now he comes home with no cash. He's been in the army for several years no money and they say well here's your bill and he's like well i can't pay this and so this is where the problem begins now soldiers were supposed to get paid they had enlisted for a specific period they signed papers and they enlisted for a specific period and they were promised a bounty in either cash or land at the end of the period if they served the whole time that they were supposed to they were also supposed to get a monthly salary. A private was supposed to get $6, which sounds ridiculous. A sergeant was supposed to get $8, and a captain was supposed to get $20 per month. That they had to buy their own uniforms and weapons. And when the war was over, most of them truly only got one month in cash of pay. So if you were a private, you're walking home with six dollars for all the years that you were in the army six dollars i don't know about you but i would have been real happy about that situation so daniel shays began to find that many farmers and other veterans were in the same situation that he was you know they'd been off fighting and they had maybe had to borrow money to buy their their guns to be able to go fight and you know when you don't pay your debt back when you have a, a loan you pay interest and the longer it takes you to pay it the more you have to pay that's just the way it works and and so i don't know if i'm sure that that's what happened but you know whatever happened he had these debts that now he's got six dollars and he can't pay and he's didn't have any money you know didn't have any earnings during that time, he did have earnings, but he didn't get paid. And so he's got nothing. And he's like, I can't pay you. I'm sorry. You know, it's just the way it is. So these farmers began to kind of band together because, you know, they all feel like they're not getting treated well. And that's what we do in this country when we when we don't like what has, something's happening. They protest. They began petitioning the Massachusetts government for debt relief. Say, look, dude, you know, we fought. We have no money. We can't pay this. We're never going to be able to pay this. We need we need some help here. But the Eastern bankers who were running things and who were the ones that were going to get all the money from the debts that were owed were like, man, we don't want to give up all that money. You know, no, we don't want this. No. And so nothing got done. The governor of Massachusetts at this time was John Hancock. You may remember his name because he was the one that signed the Declaration of Independence so big. And he was the governor, but he was refusing to enforce any of the judgments against the farmers or the veterans for their debts. He was like, no, y'all can have this piece of paper, but I'm not doing anything about it. No. But he resigned because he was in ill health. And so a new governor came in. This gentleman's name was, he was Governor James Bowden. That's how you pronounce that. It's a weird looking name, I know. But he was much more confrontational about this. <clears throat> he promised to enforce the debt judgments. And while this is going on, the state legislature is imposing more taxes on farmers. Now remember, this is a group of people that just fought a war over the fact that the taxes were bad and they didn't like the way that it was being handled. And now here they are in the same situation again. But it's their own new government that's imposing all these taxes on them. So the protests began. The tax collectors were prevented from collecting taxes. Sometimes they were beaten up. Sometimes they were intimidated. 
Yeah, you have the right to protest, but you don't really have the right to beat anybody up. I'm just saying. Property that had been seized as payment of debts was often taken back and returned to the owners of the property. In 1786, the Massachusetts legislature met and ended their session with no debt relief for the farmers or the veterans. So everybody's upset now. The, the protesters are upset because here it is. It'll, it'll be another year before they meet and look at this again. And here we are in the same situation, and we are tired of it. We're not having it anymore. So they formed themselves into groups that they called regulators, and they would go from town to town and surround the courthouse and keep the court from being able to meet and impose judgments on debt so that nobody was going to get in trouble for owing any money because we can't have court. <coughs> On September the 5th of 1786, the protesters shut down the courthouse at Worcester, Massachusetts. That's how you say that, yes. The governor was not pleased with this, and he ordered the militia, which is like the citizen army, the volunteer army, to go down and put down the protest. The soldiers got there. They realized that these people, they may have been people, some of them knew, you know, they may have served with some of these guys. And they said, look, we're not going to do this. And they refused to get involved and they refused to have any, any, to, to, to put this down. And they basically just walked off. So Governor Bowden went out and recruited a private militia, a bunch of new guys that was paid for, funded by businessmen from Boston. So this is like a private mercenary army now. On January the 25th of 1787, Daniel Shays led 1,200 protesters in a march on Springfield Armory. I guess they were gonna seize the weapons. I'm not sure, we're not sure what their plans were to do with this, but they were met by Bowdoin's private militia and these guys were willing to fight the veterans. So in the end, four protesters were killed and 20 were wounded. And all of this is going on. And, you know, we have a federal government, but under the way the Articles of Confederation was written, they can't send any troops. They don't have a National Guard or anybody that they can send <coughs> to get involved in this and make it stop happening. They don't have any way that they can get involved and tell Massachusetts to straighten up and start acting, you know, a little bit better. They, they can't do anything. They could sit there and, and, you know, twiddle their thumbs and say, man, that's bad. We wish that would stop happening. They can't, they have no power to do anything about what's happening in Massachusetts. I'm sorry, I should have skipped over this. This began to highlight problems with the Articles of Confederation. Many people, including George Washington, you remember him, he was kind of important, began to call for reforming the Articles of Confederation. So they did actually try to do that a few times. They tried to, to put in a power to, to impose taxes and not all 13 states would vote for it. And so nothing ever got done. So in the end, they decided, you know what? We need a new system. We need a new system. We're gonna have to just scrap this and start over. And so the Constitutional Convention convened or began on May the 17th of 1787, and George Washington actually came out of being a retired general and was the president of the Constitutional Convention. They hammered out this document that we now have. Thomas Jefferson wrote a lot of it. I'm sorry, um, James Madison wrote a lot of it. Thomas Jefferson wrote the Declaration of Independence. I didn't mean to confuse you there. Wrote a lot of it. Um, on September the 17th of 1787, they sent this new constitution out to all of the 13 states. All of them had ratified it and it went into effect in 1789. And that's the system that we still have now. Uh, just as another point of reference, Daniel Shays, received a pardon from the state of Massachusetts in 1788, and he was able to come home. He'd been apparently hiding out in the woods in Vermont. He was 
he died when he finally died he was buried in an unmarked grave although they have kind of gone back and put a, a place up that that um, commemorates some of what he did and it was finally mandated that the soldiers who had served in the revolutionary war would get their pay so that was one of the things that they finally did take care of which is good because you know if you're going to serve your country you ought to at least get paid for it, right okay that's all i have for you today scouts up there she says hi i don't know who that was um if you like this please subscribe give me a thumbs up uh if you like have something that you would like me to talk about leave me a comment tell me what you think um that's all i have for you today so i'll see you next time all right sully we're done <laughs>